Good morning. All right, let's do some math. Uh, oh, let me just make sure that I posted, I think I posted uh, these notes for you guys too. Let me just check. Or did I forget? There's always that chance. I did. So I posted the polynomial and rational functions. Uh, I called it part one, even though it's all of chapter three, all our chapter three notes in there. Um, what I'll do after today, we'll probably only get through 3.1. So I'll break it up and make part two, part three, whatever. Um, but I, I threw them all in there just so we have them. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I've already brought that in here. So, whoop, don't delete it. I wanna bring it into ours. Okay. So, let's see here. Shoo, shoo, shoo. It's 120. Almost Halloween. Although I suspect it's gonna be a weird Halloween. I'm not sure what's going to happen. That's okay. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, let's, so we did a lot last day, right? We talked about combining functions, right? So algebraically, so combining functions, we can do it algebraically. So that's things like uh, f plus g, f minus g, right? We're making new functions given two functions, f and g. Uh, we can just work with these algebraically. Uh, f times g and f divided by g. Or we can do function compositions. So compositions, which were things like f composed with g or f of g, which we write f of g of x, right? So wherever we see an x, we're gonna replace it with g of x. So we're kind of stuffing, or we are stuffing a function inside a function. And you can do function compositions with more than two functions, but we're just gonna to stick to two. Two is plenty for us. Um, so you can have different types of compositions, f composed with f, for example, that's f of f of x. And we're gonna keep working with uh, function compositions today, right? Because what we said, and I'll bring it up later on, is to confirm that we have an inverse, well, what we do is we use that uh, cancellation property that the inverse of f of x should equal x and the function at the inverse should also equal x. Right? So I'll, I'll, I'll write that in our notes, but I'm just kind of going how we worked through it. So then we said, okay, well, we can also talk about one-to-one -one functions. One-to-one -one functions, well, that was when so one-to-one -one functions means that uh, for, if for each output f of x, there can only be one input, right? Meaning that we can't land at the same output from two separate inputs, then it's not one-to-one. -one. There are lots of functions that are not one-to-one. -one. We mentioned that even functions are not one-to-one -one unless we restrict the domain. Uh, so one-to-one -one functions, what we do is we show that, um, if f of a is equal to f of b, means a equals b, we can conclude f of x is one to one. Why did we care about functions being one to one? We care because uh, it has to be, so a function has to be one-to-one -one in order to find the inverse, right? So 
uh, a function must be one to one in order to find the inverse. So then the next thing that we did was find the inverse. Find the inverse of f of x. Okay, and there were some steps there too. A lot of steps here. To find the inverse, right, so once you've shown that it's one to one, then you can go ahead and find the inverse. In fact, if I ask you to find the inverse, you should show that it's one to one first. Um, what you do first is you write y equals f of x. Then you switch your x's and y's, and then you solve for y. That new, new y is the inverse f of x. So write y, oops. Write y equals f of x. Second step, exchange x's and y's. Exchange x's and y's. Three, solve for y. Uh, the final solution is y equals f inverse of x. Oops, why won't it? Oh no, oh no, did my pen run out? Say it isn't so. It is so. Okay, that's okay. We can talk about what we did last day Right, so if you go to your notes last day, and because we didn't quite finish the example that we were working on, right, so here, I right, uh, can't even use a pointer here. Maybe I can. No, doesn't like it. Um, so, We started and we did 54. So f of x we established was x minus two over x plus two. So then what we did was first up, show that f of x is one to one, which we did, right? Uh, we showed it by saying f of a equals f of b. We're forcing that to be true. And then we're gonna hope that a equals b is what falls out. So um, f of a, a minus two over a plus two, f of b, b minus two over b plus two, and then we shift and rearrange stuff and what fell out is a equals b. And then what I want you to do is I always want you to say, therefore f of x is one to one. Okay? And so, and then it's implied that we're able to find the inverse. You don't have to say that part, but I do want you to say, okay, because a equals b, this function is one to one. Then we were supposed to, we were going to find the inverse of f of x is x minus 2 over x plus 2. So what we do is we write y equals f of x. Okay, So y equals x minus 2 over x plus 2. I get uh, and what we find is equal negative two is one brown inverse of. Uh, okay, we're going to confess this is, right? And 
confirm that you have actually found the inverse, right? And it's nice for checking your work too. What you're showing is that F composed with the inverse is equal to X and the inverse composed with F is also equal to X. So you know you want to end up at equals X, right? So it should just end up at X or, or just X. Uh, and if it does, then you have found the inverse. If it doesn't, the inverse that you found is, is probably wrong or you did your compositions incorrectly at some point. So maybe check, um, check some, some of your work, right? If it doesn't fall out with an X. So what we did was um, we went through and we did F composed with the inverse of X and we found that indeed it equals X, right? So let me check on this darn pencil, 26%. That should be enough. Okay. So y equals f inverse of x. Okay. So that's what we did last day. And then after you find the inverse, you can confirm the inverse is in fact the inverse by using the cancellation properties so you have to show that f composed with the inverse of x is equal to x and f inverse composed with the function is also equal to x. So both of those have to be true. So last day we were working with, and now I'll go steal it here because I had it here. Copy. So last day, we found, we found f of x, we found that f of x is one to one, oops, one to one. We found the inverse, found f inverse of x, and we also showed that, which one did we do? Let me just confirm here. We showed that f composed with the inverse is equal to x. So now we're going to show that the inverse composed with the function is also equal to x to finish this off. And then we'll start a fresh one because uh, these things are pretty hard. So. Uh, we showed that f composed with the inverse is equal to x. Now show the inverse composed with the function is equal to, and so I'm just going to go is equal to x, I guess. All right, so we've got the function, so the inverse of the function is all right so the inverse is negative two times one plus x over x minus one so wherever i see an x i'm going to replace it with f of x so negative two times one plus f of x divided by f of x minus one what a mistake to make it would trip me up completely uh so you want to be really careful when you're copying these up Okay, from here, I'm going to substitute f of x with x minus 2 over x plus 2. So I'm just going to stuff those in, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. So negative 2 times 1 plus, and then x minus 2 over x plus 2. And I'll be really frivolous with my brackets here. x minus 2 over x plus 2 minus one. Okay. 
I've got essentially a fraction plus a fraction, which means I have to have a, a common denominator, right? My common denominator is going to be x plus 2. Same thing down here, I'm going to have a common denominator of x plus 2 as well. So what's nice is if you just kind of foreshadow, you've got a fraction over a fraction, those are going to flip and multiply, and that x plus 2 is going to cancel out. But you need to keep it in there and show it until the very end. So we get negative 2 on the outside times 1 and then x plus 2 over x plus 2 plus x minus 2 over x plus 2 over x minus 2 over x plus 2 minus 1 and then times that common denominator x plus 2 over x plus 2. Now I'm going to write this over the common denominator. I'm also going to eventually simplify the numerators and so I get negative 2 times x plus 2 plus x minus 2 all over x plus 2. All divided by x minus 2 minus x minus 2. Be really careful, you have to bring this negative inside the x and the 2, right? And so you want to be really careful there bringing that negative inside over x plus 2. Some of these things can cancel out, right? I get x plus x, which is 2x, uh, but then 2 minus 2 is going to go away, and then down here we got x minus x, so that's going to go away. So I have negative 2 times uh, 2x over x plus 2, And I'll do one more step where it's a fraction over a fraction, negative 4 over x plus 2. Now I can simplify this, a fraction over a fraction, and uh, I'll be able to cancel this x plus 2. So here we've got negative 2 times 2x over x plus 2 times, flip, negative 4 goes on the bottom, x plus 2 goes on the top, x plus 2 over negative 4. Okay. We're so close, we can, we can see the end of the tunnel here, right, because this x plus 2 is going to cancel, and then negative 2 times 2 is negative 4, which is going to cancel with this negative 4, and just like that, you have x. So you have x plus 2 and x plus 2 are going to cancel, which puts us at, I'll just write out negative 4x over negative 4, which of course is going to cancel as well. Now that we've shown that both uh, f composed with the inverse and the inverse composed with f both equal x, now we can conclude that therefore f inverse of x, so the inverse that we found, therefore f inverse of x is indeed the inverse of f of x. I'm keeping it generic. You could definitely write out what the, uh, what the inverse function is and what the actual function is. At this point, you're probably just excited that you got to x, so I'm happy if you uh, remember to do a conclusion. You should write a conclusion, right? So therefore, it is indeed the inverse of x, of inverse of f of x. Let's do, uh, let's do another one. Maybe we'll do another one of these um, with a fraction in it, right? These fraction ones are nasty, and then We'll also do 68. So I'll grab these questions.
this. Oops. Hey, there's my dog. How cute. <laughs> Not what I meant to paste though. <laughs> Uh, based image there. That's really clever. Anyways, handy. Um, all right. So this 54 is the one we just did up here. Okay. Let's do, notice that a lot of these have kind of a similar shape. Right, 57, 58, 59, 60. Those all have similar forms to what we just did in 54. Maybe let's do 56. And then um, I also wanna do something like 68, right? Something a little bit different. So let's do 56 and 68. For practice, right, it would be really good. So just I'm not on a test. I'm not gonna make you do one where you have to restrict the domain. Okay. So, uh, and then back again in, in 70. So don't worry about those, do those for, for extra practice, right? But I'm not gonna make you do one of those on the test. So, um, for practice, for a test, Right, and we should have a test coming up, not too soon, but soon-ish. Because uh, I think at the beginning of the term, you guys said you wanted three tests. You might have changed your minds now, uh, but I'll do a little check-in um, probably next week and see what you guys want to do. So uh, for practice for a test, do... 49 to 60 and 65 to 69. And then part A, show it is one to one. B, find the inverse. C, confirm the inverse. Okay, so this is a lot of problems, right, uh, to work through. But once you're, so because it's asking you to find the inverse, it is one-to-one. -one. So you should be able to show that it is one-to-one. -one, uh, and then find the inverse and then confirm the inverse. This incorporates a lot of math, right? And so it's a really, really good test problem to have kind of uh, a multi-part question like this, where I give you a function. And so we'll do it with 56 and 68. We already did it with 54. And then you can work out, uh, on some more on your own time. But we're going to go through and do all these parts together. Okay. So let's do 56. 56 is f of x is 3x over x minus 2. Okay. So first thing we have to do is show that it's one to one. Okay, so part a, show f of x is one to one. Well, to do that, right, I have to show that f of a is equal to f of b, and then that means that a equals b. So this is where I start, and then I'm gonna plug in a for x here. So I get 3a over a minus two is 3b over b minus two. Then I'm gonna rearrange these things, right? I'm gonna bring this b minus two over to the left-hand side, the a minus two over to the right-hand side. 
And then I'm going to expand and then hopefully simplify to A equals B. I know it's going to simplify and you know it's going to simplify because it has to be one to one in order to be able to find the inverse. So that's why I like these questions because they're, they have to be one to one. So I get 3A times B minus 2 is 3B times A minus 2. Okay. So I'm going to expand this out. 3AB minus 6A is 3AB minus 6B. Okay. What I like to do is I like to shift everything over to one side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 3AB and add 6B to this side here. Um, or because... Wait, uh, because this one's smaller than what we saw before, I could probably get away with just uh, subtracting 3AB from both sides, seeing that they cancel out and then have negative 6A equals to negative 6B. But if you like to follow the same procedure for all of them, I would shift everything over and then uh, find A equals B. So I get 3AB minus 6A minus 3AB equals negative 6B. 3AB minus 3AB. So I find negative 6A is negative 6B. A is going to be negative 6B divided by negative 6 which of course is going to cancel out and a equals b. Therefore, f of x is 1 to 1. Careful. Uh, therefore, f of x is 1 to 1. Good. Part B, find the inverse. Find the inverse of f of x. Notice that all these parts, right, show f of x is one to one. Could be f of x could be anything, right? The only thing that's new is f of x. And then how we do it is all gonna be the same. So find the inverse of f of x all right, remember step one, write y equals f of x. So y in this case, y equals 3x over x minus 2. Okay, step two, exchange x's and y's. It's too early. My dog's woken up already. She usually sleeps right until, just until we finish. I feel like that's when she starts getting antsy. X is 3y over y minus 2. Okay, step 3, solve for y, uh, the final y is f inverse of x. So here, if I solve for y, I'm going to have to rearrange this, right? Move the y minus 2 over to the, to the left-hand side. Uh, I'm sorry, she, she took off. Um, I'm going to let you work on that and I'll be back in just, okay, we're back. This rascal, she's crazy. She's old. She's really old, but she's still a troublemaker. <laughs> All right. So we're ready to solve for Y. All right. So from x equals 3y over y minus 2, if we're solving for y, 
I'm going to move the y minus 2 over to the left hand side so I get x times y minus 2 is 3y. And then if I expand this out, right, the goal is to solve for y. So I need to kind of get all the y's uh, shaken out. So I get xy minus 2x is 3y. So what I can do, I want to try to collect my y's on one side. So if that means uh, maybe moving the xy over to the right hand side or moving the 3y over to the left hand side and moving the 2x over to the right hand side, it doesn't matter. You're going to end up at the same place. Uh, what I'm going to do maybe is move the xy over to the right hand side. So I get negative 2x is 3y minus xy. Now I'm able to factor out a common y. So I get negative 2, oops, not y, that, that would make a mess. Negative 2x is y times 3 minus x. Solving for y, here's where, where I get a little, little crazy. Um, I always like to have my y over on the left hand side. And so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to divide both sides by 3 minus x. So 3 minus x is going to go over here, negative 2x over 3 minus x. But then what I'm also going to do in the same move is remember the equal sign a equals b is the same as b equals a. So I'm going to switch these over. And so don't be, don't be alarmed when I write y equals negative 2x over 3 minus x. I did kind of two moves in one. So therefore, the inverse of x is negative 2x over 3 minus x. Good. So make this look like it, more like a 2 here. Boop. So now I've got the inverse, uh, or what I'm claiming to be the inverse, right? And so here, y. I'm going to replace it with the inverse of f of x um, just to make it look cleaner. Okay. So now confirm that the inverse you found, or I'll say we found, is indeed the inverse. So what does that mean? Well, just as a little recap, right? It means we have to show that f composed with the inverse of x, f of x, is equal to x, and f inverse composed with the function is also equal to x. Right? We just did one, but we're going to do more so we get more comfortable. It always helps to write down just to remember what your functions were, because otherwise it gets confusing. So paste that, okay. F of x and the inverse, copy. And I'll just say, kind of recall, just because it's a, it's just to remember what they were. And what I might do is I might solve these side by side. Looks like I'm going to have enough room. So um, sometimes it's just nicer to have them kind of running side by side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have f composed with the inverse of x on this side. Well, f of x is 3x over x minus 2. And then wherever I see an x, I'm going to replace it with the inverse. So this becomes 3f inverse of x over the f inverse of x minus 2. Okay. So now this becomes 3 times the inverse, which is negative 2x over 3 minus x, so it gets really nasty. Negative 2x over 3 minus x. What's nice here is um, 
before we were adding two fractions inside there, so we had to find that common denominator. Slightly harder than what we're about to do here. Uh, well, I guess we'll need a common denominator here, but only one. Negative 2x over 3 minus x minus 2. Okay. I'm just going to go and multiply by 3 minus x over 3 minus x over here on the minus 2 right away because I know I'm going to need that common denominator. So I'm not messing around here times 3 minus x over 3 minus x, right? Because then now I'm able to combine this as a, as a fraction, as a single fraction. So this becomes, uh, and I'm going to bring this 3 inside, right? 3 times negative 2x is negative 6x, and then over 3 minus x. So negative 6x over 3 minus x divided by negative 2x minus 2 times 3, which is negative 6, and then negative 2 times minus x, that's going to be plus 2x. So be really, really careful, right? You have to bring this onto both terms. So I get negative 2x minus 6 plus 2x over 3 minus x. Notice that negative 2x plus 2x is going to cancel out. So that's nice. So now I've got a fraction over a fraction, a fraction over a fraction. I'm going to flip the denominator and multiply, right? And um, I always do that when I'm, even when I'm doing math for myself, I always kind of in my mind, I go, mm, mm, okay. So I find it's really helpful. Times three minus X, which I'll put brackets around them to show that they're one thing, uh, over negative six. These of course are gonna cancel, boom, boom. And negative 6 over negative 6 is going to cancel, and I'm left with x. Okay, so now I've shown half of it, right? I've shown that this f composed with the inverse is equal to x. That's a good start. It means that our, our inverse is likely correct. So now let's do the inverse composed with the function. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of Put a little divider up here. To do the other side. So F inverse of F of X is going to be um, uh, Let's see here, f inverse is negative 2x over 3 minus x, okay, but I'm going to replace the x's with f of x. So I get negative 2, oops, negative 2 f of x divided by 3 minus f of x. Okay. Now f of x is 3x over x minus 2, so I'm going to replace those. And so I get negative 2 times 3x over x minus 2 divided by 3 minus 3x over x minus 2. Here, I don't need a common, in fact, I have a common denominator of x minus 2 because I'm multiplying. Here, I, again, I'm going to need a common denominator in order to combine these. Right, and so I'm going to do times x minus 2. I'm going to show it on this side here, x minus 2. That's OK. Kind of fluky that we ended up doing kind of the same thing. Well, not fluky, um, but not necessarily always the case that you kind of run things side by side like this. But it, it's nice to see. So now this becomes negative 2 times 3x. I'm going to expand that in and have negative 6x. So negative 6x over x minus 2 
divided by, and then I'm going to expand this out. Uh, expand out the numerator and put it over x minus 2. So I get 3x minus 6 minus 3x over x minus 2. And I'm going to throw some brackets around here. You don't have to, but um, if the brackets aren't multiplying anything, they're just extra, right? You're just throwing them on there just to keep things kind of straight in your mind, but they're just to help you visualize things. And so now I've got a fraction over a fraction. I can cancel 3x minus 3x is, of course, 0. And so I get negative 6x over x minus 2 times x minus 2, fraction over fraction, flip and multiply, divided by negative 6. x minus 2 cancels with x minus 2, and negative 6 cancels with negative 6. And again, we get x. Therefore, the inverse f of x is indeed the inverse of f of x. Eee! Fact, wee! Right? So that's great. A lot of work, right? Um, but it, it's a really good test question for that reason. Okay, let's do one more. I think I said I wanted to do, which one was it? 68. So let's do 68. Same idea. Show that it's one to one, find the inverse, prove that it, that is the inverse, All right? I'll put it on a fresh page here. So 68 says f of x is 2 plus the root of 3 plus x. Show f of x is 1 to 1. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up f of a equals f of b. So we have 2 plus the root of 3 plus a is 2 plus the root of 3 plus b. All right, so far it looks good. I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. So I get 2 plus the root of 3 plus a minus 2 is the root of 3 plus b. Of course, 2 minus 2 is going to disappear. And then if I have to undo the square root either way, I have to square both sides. What's nice is squaring both sides, I get rid of both square roots, right? So I take the square root of 3 plus a squared is the square root of 3 plus b squared. Well, squaring the square root kind of cancels the two out. So now we have 3 plus a is 3 plus b. So now, right, I can subtract 3 from both sides. So 3 plus a minus 3 is b. Of course, 3 minus 3 leaves us at a equals b. Woohoo! We knew that would happen because I'm at, we're asked to find the inverse, so it has to be 1 to 1. But I want you to confirm that it's 1 to 1. Therefore, f of x is 1 to 1. That's good. OK. Part B, find the inverse. How about we find the inverse without writing out the steps explicitly, right? We've been writing out the steps. So write y equals f of x, exchange your x's and y's, and then solve for y. So here we go. Find the inverse y equals, what was our function? 
2 plus the root of 3 plus x. So if we exchange our x's and y's, right, then so x is equal to 2 plus the root of 3 plus y. Now I'm going to solve for y, right, so slowly migrate things over and isolate y on its own. So x minus 2 is the root of 3 plus y. I can square both sides. x minus 2 squared is 3 plus y. Notice that I'm picking up the pace a little bit here. So I'm not showing that it's uh, canceling the square root anymore. It's fine. We can just do that. Uh, and then subtract 3 from both sides, leaving us with y. But also do that revolving door. So we get y is x minus 2 squared minus 3. Okay, so therefore f inverse of x should be x minus 2 squared minus 3. Okay, we're going to confirm this, right, in part c, I'm making up part c, confirm that this is the inverse. I'm just going to say, okay, so recall, oops, just because it was so long ago, recall f of x was 2 plus the root of 3 plus x, and f inverse of x we just found is x minus 2 squared minus 3. I just find it's helpful to have them handy when I'm doing these compositions. So to confirm this, I need to show, um, in fact, maybe I'll just jump right to it. F of F inverse of X is equal to, and I'm going to move this over and I'm going to do the same thing um, that we just did. This is the only note that I'll write here, kind of helpful note. Show f of f inverse of x equals x and f inverse of f of x equals x. Right? That's what it means to do. So now, starting with f, f inverse of x, or f composed with the inverse of f of x, um, we start with f and we plug in f of inverse. So we get 2 plus the root of 3 plus f inverse of x. Okay. Substituting, it, substituting in the inverse, we get 2 plus the root of 3 plus, and then the inverse, I'm going to put it all in brackets just so I don't lose any negatives or anything like that. Uh, x minus 2 squared minus 3. And this is 2 plus the root of 3 plus x minus 2 squared minus 3. Of course, the 3 minus 3 we can get rid of. So now I'm just left with x minus 2 squared and then square rooted. So all I'm left with really is x minus 2, but I'm going to show that. 2 plus the root of x minus 2 squared. Of course, these two kind of cancel out. And so we've got 2 plus x minus 2, which those brackets aren't really doing anything because it's adding uh, in front. And so we've got 2 minus 2, I get x. I see I wrote a little bit large here, so I'm going to move this over. Because then side by side, just to have everything, otherwise I'm scrolling so much. Uh, and for these, it's okay if you guys want to write side by side, that's totally fine. Um, mostly because it's mostly for you anyways. Um, 
So here, I'm just gonna put up a little, a little divider. And so now I'm gonna find f of f, f inverse of f. Okay, so the inverse function is x minus two squared minus three. Replacing x with f of x, I get f of x minus two squared minus three. Okay, f of x is, and I'm putting brackets around it, two plus the root of three plus x, and then minus two squared minus three. Okay, so these brackets aren't doing anything around the two plus the root of three plus x. So I can cancel two minus two, that's good. Because again, that square root is gonna cancel with the square. So what I get is I get the root of three plus x squared minus three. Well, these are gonna cancel out. Oh, brown, weird. Uh, which is three plus x minus three. Three minus three is gonna go away. One line sooner than the other one, but I probably showed less work. Um, we end up at x. So therefore, f inverse of x is indeed the inverse of f of x. Good. These are big problems, right? But once you've done enough of them and you kind of see the pattern and, and just kind of uh, you're always able to check your work, right? f of a equals f of b, well a must be equal to b because it is one-to-one, -one, so you have to show it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, and then once you've found the inverse, well you're confirming that the inverse you found is correct by doing the function composition, so that's good. All right, uh, where was this? Finally, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the graph, in fact, no time at all, but let's just mention it here. The graph of the inverse is the original function f of x, but it's flipped across the uh, y equals x line. So it gets kind of weird. So it goes, uh, so if you have this original function that looks like this, it gets reflected around uh, the diagonal y equals x. Okay. We're not gonna use that a, a whole lot, but it is good to know that it is a reflection around the y equals x line. Good. So that's the end of chapter two. Okay. Um, and I posted, like I said, I posted the chapter three notes, all of them, 3.1, uh, starts with quadratic functions. We've already seen quadratic functions, but uh, we're going to add to them a little bit. So, uh, let's see here. What were we doing? All right. <laughs> I remember. I'm going to copy this in here and then we'll start on a fresh page here. Okay. So we start with quadratic functions and models. We've already seen quadratic functions. Quadratic functions, we found the zeros or, or um, the factors using the quadratic formula. Right, and so uh, we've already seen, we have already seen quadratics in chapter one. Oops, we 
in chapter one, where we uh, use the quadratic formula, right, to solve for the zeros of something like this, right? Where does, what x values make this zero? Or what we're finding is actually the x-intercepts. So here, a quadratic function is a polynomial function with degree two. And there is a little blurb up here, right? The degree of a polynomial is just the highest power of x. And so if the highest power of x is two, then you have a quadratic. But we've already talked about that, so it's just a refresher, so don't, don't be scared. Um, so a quadratic function is something that looks like this, as long as a is not equal to zero. If a were zero, a times x squared would be zero. And then if you don't have the ax squared, well, then you just have bx plus c, which is a straight line, right? So that would be a linear equation. Um, so we've already seen quadratics in, in chapter one, where we uh, used the quadratic equation x equals negative b plus minus the root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. To factor or to find the zeros of the quadratic. Uh, which we then used to find, uh, to factor the quadratic. Used to factor the quadratic. Right, so just as a quick example, if we find that x is two and negative three, Right, the factors would be x minus two, because when I plug in x equals two, I have to get zero times x plus three. Because again, when I plug in negative three here, I have to land at zero. So it's kind of the reverse of these. So that's what we use to factor quadratics easily. And so well, here when x is negative three. That's how we saw quadratics earlier. And then we kind of went and I said, oh, there's some more stuff that we don't need right now, but we'll need later. And here we are. We need some more stuff now. So it is back in 1.5, but I'm going to make a note uh, of what we need. But before we do that, let's talk about just a little bit more about what's going on here. So a quadratic the shape of a quadratic is always going to be a parabola. It's going to be either pointing up or pointing down, but it'll always be a parabola. So I'm going to add that up here, actually. Quadratic functions. Quadratic functions are always parabolas. So that means they just look like this or look like this. We've talked about that in general with the graphing just briefly. Um, the highest or the degree of the polynomial is going to dictate the shape of this thing. So even though there is another x in here, maybe making a bit of a mess, um, as, as soon as there is an x squared, the general shape of this thing is going to be a parabola. Right? And for quadratics especially, it's going to be just a nice looking parabola like this or like this. 
So the general form of any quadratic is going to be like this or like this. Some terminology is that this is the vertex. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, I'm getting a phone call. Where did you guys go? There. Still good? Okay. I don't know why it does that. It jumps out and even if I, yeah, anyways. Um, so the vertex, if you've got a parabola pointing up, then the vertex is going to be the minimum of this thing. If you've got a parabola pointing down, then the vertex is going to be the maximum of this thing. So it just depends on uh, what the shape of the parabola is. We determine the shape by A. So if A is uh, positive, then it's pointing up. And if A in AX squared is negative, then it's pointing down. Right? So we can tell a lot by just looking at uh, this function like this. To find the position in standard form by, I don't know if you have heard of it in maybe a different math class or something like that, uh, but we'll go through it now. So let's see here. Completing the square which is from section 1.5 So here, this was one of those things that I said, ah, let's parking lot it until we need it. And here we are. So uh, where are those notes? Taking a wild guess here. It looks pretty good. This is 1.4. Okay, 1.5 and then the second page at 1.5. We've got this completing the square, which I'll bring in and we'll have in our notes. Okay. Completing the square. If you have something like x squared plus bx, Sometimes we have to make it look like x squared plus bx. If we want to make this a perfect square, we have to add b over 2, where b is from here, squared. If you're adding something, you also have to subtract that something. And that's not clear here. But what we're establishing here is that, OK, well, once you have it written like this, then you can rewrite it as this perfect square. So I'm just going to say that this here is a perfect square. Okay. And so that's going to be the goal is to be able to scrunch this thing together into a perfect square. All right. So what are we going to do? Let's because sometimes I, I find uh, a lot of students kind of don't like when I do it with just the plain variables. And because it gets really messy, uh, moving from, this is called general form to standard form. So here, this is general form. And this is standard form. They're equivalent but just different ways of writing things. And remember, the whole goal of putting it in standard form is because the vertex is at hk. So when you have it in this form, you've got hk, and you can easily find the vertex, right? And that's how I want you to find the vertex. So um, 
All right, so to put in something into standard form, let's just do it with a, with a problem that we have. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's just grab some of these problems and we'll just work through the first one nice and slow. So it says a quadratic function f is given. Okay, so all these are quadratics. We can kind of scan and see it looks good. Um, express f in standard form. I'm going to say that's probably the hardest part. And so that's what we're, we're going to work towards doing here. We have to complete the square. So that's where we're introducing completing the square. Um, and then once we have it in standard form, we can find the vertex, the x and the y intercepts. Mm -hmm x-intercepts are where it crosses the x-axis, right? So where y is zero. And the y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis, so where x is zero. So we use those um, to solve for the x and the y-intercepts. Then we're gonna sketch a quick graph of f, and we can use that to find the domain and range of f. Um, when we sketch the graph, I'm gonna encourage you to use Desmos to check your work to see, just to make sure that everything you did is, is good. Or you can do it as you go along, right? But um, where is the fun in that? So let's do nine first to get a little warmed up here. So f of x, f of x is x squared minus two x plus three. Okay, so, all right, first thing we want to do is write in standard form. All right, I've got x squared minus 2x plus 3, okay? This is in general form, or I'll put the line up top here. What I have to do is I have to kind of work with this x squared minus 2x because remember to make x squared plus bx, so in our case b is 2, so it's going to be nice and, nice and easy looking at 2 divided by 2, right? But we're just kind of getting the hang of it here. We have to add b over 2 squared in order to be able to rewrite this as a perfect square. So here we go. Um, so we can write, so group x squared minus 2x away from plus 3. So here, group ax, oh sorry, just x squared plus bx. Okay, in this case, it's just x squared minus 2x, and so b is negative 2, keeping in mind that negative. Putting these brackets on didn't change anything, right? I'm still adding 3, doesn't matter. But I'm allowed to do that, and, and sometimes it's really helpful. So now, what I have to do is I have to add, add b over 2 squared in order to make it a perfect square. But if I'm adding b over 2 squared, then what I get is I get x squared minus 2x plus negative 2 over 2 squared. Okay. So here, what I'm doing is I'm adding add b over 2 squared. Okay. If I'm adding something, I can't just add something willy-nilly. I'm not allowed to change the meaning of this expression, right? And so what I have to do is I also have to subtract b over 2 squared. But that I can do that minus negative 2 over 2 squared. Okay. 
must also subtract b over 2 squared. Okay. So that's what's going on there. And then finally, putting that bracket back on here, I get plus 3 on the outside. And I'm going to make this bracket just a little bit bigger there. <clears throat> Even though this simplifies, I think it might be easier to see that this is our perfect square, right? So that's the part that we're going to rewrite. And then I'm going to simplify everything else. So, um, so here, this, or oops. This is our perfect square. So that part, I can rewrite, just referring to this, this little side note here. I've got it like this, right? If I group those things together, I can rewrite as x plus b over 2 squared. So this. I'm going to rewrite as x plus negative 2 over 2 all squared. Okay. Where this is the perfect square rewritten. So what I did was I, I kind of lumped these together, making sure that I put the brackets back on here. So now I'm here, minus, and then this I can simplify. Negative 2 over 2 is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is just 1, so minus 1 plus 3. But then this I can bring outside. It's just adding, subtracting. And so what I have is I have x plus, and this I can simplify, uh, negative 2 divided by 2 is just negative 1. So it's actually x minus 1 squared. And then minus 1 plus 3 is plus 2. Okay. This is in the standard form, right? It's in the form of a times x plus, uh, sorry, minus h squared plus k. Okay. So now this is in standard form a x minus h squared plus k, k where a is 1, h is 1, and k is 2. Where a is 1, h is 1, and k is 2. Okay. For this first one, because it's our first time completing the square and it, it's kind of weird, what I want you to do is I want you to just expand this out and make sure that it gets you back to the original equation, right? And so we're going to check your work. Check your work. This is optional, but we'll do it just this first time. Right, what we want to show is uh, x minus 1 squared plus 2 is it the same as the original equation, which is x squared minus 2x plus 3? So let's try that. Is x squared minus 2x plus 3? Notice that here, this is just the standard form. And this is the general form, but they have to have the same meaning. Otherwise, something went wrong. So we're going to check our work. 
I'm going to expand this side and hopefully it's equal to this, right? And so remember that x minus 1 squared is x minus 1 oops, times x minus 1 plus 2. So that's going to be x squared minus x minus x plus 1 plus 2, which actually does equal all well, here which is x squared minus 2x plus 3, which is equal to x squared minus 2x plus 3. Bink! All right, just kind of quickly checking your work, making sure that these things are the same. Okay. The standard form, getting to the standard form is the hardest part. Yeah. For part B of this question, we have to find the vertex. Well, the vertex, just from our notes, is at hk, which in our case, we said h is 1 and k is 2. So it's at x equals 1 and y equals 2. We already know a lot about this parabola, right? So thinking about our parabola, well, a is positive here. Right, so A is positive. We know that this thing is going to be pointing up. Okay, if the vertex, the vertex is the bottom of this thing then, is at 1, 2, I'm not expecting any x-intercepts, right? I'm not expecting it to ever cross the x-axis because it's starting up above the x-axis and then it's going up above. So here, just as a little side note, Since a is 1 is greater than 0, we know this parabola is pointing up. Okay. And the vertex is above the x-axis, right? And so, and the vertex is above the x-axis. So it's going to look something like this. If I put 1, 2 here, oops. it should look something kind of like this. I'm not expecting to find any x uh, uh, x-intercepts, right? So therefore, we are not expecting to find any x-intercepts. That's just a little check-in point for yourself, right? You don't have to do that. Uh, the next step that we're going to do is find the x-intercepts. I'm going to show you what to do, but um, you'll see that we're not going to find any. So the x-intercept is where y equals 0. And we've got two equations, right, or two quadratic equations um, just in different forms. You can use whichever one you like. Uh, I'm going to use the, the standard form. We worked hard to get to the standard form, so I'm going to use it. Uh, but if you wanted to, you could use the quadratic formula from the general form to find the, the x-intercepts. That's totally fine. Um, but what you're going to find is that, okay, if y is, and then I forgot what my x minus 1 squared plus 2. I want to make sure I got it right. Yeah. So then if I set y equals z to 0, I'm going to have 0 here, and I have to solve for the values of x that make that happen. So 0 is x minus 2, oh, sorry, minus 1 squared plus 2. All right. Solving for x, I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. So negative 2 is x minus 1 squared. Taking the square root of both sides. <laughs> I can't take the square root of a negative number, right? 
And so that's where I have to stop. And that's how I know that I don't have any X intercepts and that's okay, right? So here, square root of negative two is X minus one. Put it in red. Since we can't take the square root of a negative number, we do not have any x-intercepts. We do not have any x-intercepts. And that, that is in line with what we were expecting, right? So now let's go ahead and find the y-intercept. The y-intercept is where x is zero. I'm going to use the, the standard form that we worked for, uh, but if you wanted to use the general form, that's totally fine too. So y equals x minus 1 squared plus 2, just confirming, yeah. So y is 0 minus 1 squared plus 2. Negative 1 squared is 1. 1 plus 2 is 3, so y equals 3. Oh, I guess I should show one more step. 1 plus 2, y equals 3. So therefore, the y-intercept is at 0, 3. Okay. So for part C, I'm going to sketch my graph. Now I know a couple of things about this thing, right? I've got, well, actually I'll use one of those fancy insert a sticky and Okay, I'll put it here. So I've got a y-intercept at 0, 3, so I'll plug that on here. Uh, 0, 3, 1, 2, 3. The vertex we found was at 1, 2. One, two. So keeping in mind that a parabola should be rounded, right, when you draw these, it's going to be kind of hard. It's going to look kind of like, like that. Not very good, but okay. Now, let's confirm this, all of this using Desmos. Okay, so we go into Desmos and the first thing we're going to do is <coughs> I'm going to confirm that the standard form I found is the same as the general form. We already did, right? We expanded it. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to have x minus 1 squared and then plus 2. So from here, Right, looks good. It looks like I found the same vertex and the same y-intercept. Right, makes sense because I used the standard form to, to find those. Um, so what I want to do is I also want to graph the original function, which was x squared minus 2x plus 3. I'm glad that these two overlap. Right, and if you kind of go, well, it's not zero, there, there, there. They're overlapping. That's a good thing because it means that these two are the same and the standard form I found is accurate, right? And so that's where you can first check your work, right? Map these two, 
graph them, are they the same? Yes, okay, you did it right. Then you can confirm your vertex, your y-intercept, in this case there are no x-intercepts, but when it's flipped down or if it were flipped down, uh, you would be able to find the y-intercept or the x-intercepts as well. So let's do, let's do another one of these. <clears throat> Oh yeah, and then um, the last part of this question is the domain and range. Let's see if I can... Uh -oh. Undo, undo. <clears throat> How can I move this whole thing? Uh oh, now I've done it, huh? Undo, undo, undo. D, <laughs> the domain. What's nice about uh, all parabolas, so all quadratic equations, the domain is going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity. So it's always going to be the set of real numbers. So negative infinity to positive infinity. The range is your y values. So here, oh, ah, rats. Where was this? Oh, I know what happened. I had to go and muck it up. Close enough. Uh, the range, right, you can look at your graph. It's going to include the vertex. This looks like a four, but it's actually a one. It's going to include the vertex. So uh, here it starts at two and then it goes all the way up to positive infinity. Oh, and what I wanted to say about the domain, even though it looks like it kind of tapers off this parabola, it actually keeps going and going and going to positive infinity, negative infinity. So don't be thrown off there. Uh, so it includes the vertex, which is at two up to positive infinity, round brackets around infinity. Good. Now let's do another one. <clears throat> so let's do, let's do, I wanted to do a little bit of a trickier one, uh, 14. And we're going to go through and, and do the exact same stuff that we just did. So 14 is f of x is equal to negative x squared plus 10x. What's nice is that it's almost in the form of x squared uh, plus bx already. So for completing the square, it's a little bit easier. And remember, we had to kind of move out that plus three before. We don't have to do that anymore. But one thing that we need to do is pull out this common negative, right? And so what we get is this is negative x squared minus 10x. This I'll be able to use for completing the square. Now we can complete the square. <clears throat> okay. So what are we going to do? I'm going to add b over 2 squared to this thing. So I get negative and then x squared minus 10x plus b over 2, b is negative 10, negative 10 divided by 2 squared. If I'm adding it, I have to also subtract it. So minus negative 10 over 2 squared. Making sure this negative is on the outside of all of this, right? So we're going to have to be really careful. 
you can go ahead and, and uh, simplify this. I, because we're going to rewrite it like this, so this portion is the same as x plus negative 10 over 2 and then squared. I would probably keep it like negative 10 over 2 for just this step. And then you can simplify things. So here, let's write it out. So we get negative, I'll put big brackets around here, uh, x plus negative 10 divided by 2, then squared, minus negative 10 divided by 2 squared. Okay. So this here is our perfect square, and this I'll be able to simplify a little bit. So what I get here is I get negative, and then I'll put a square bracket, x plus, but then negative 10 divided by 2, so that puts me at minus 5 squared. And then here again, negative 10 divided by 2 is negative 5 squared is uh, minus 25. Not quite in standard form because this negative is on the outside, so I'm going to bring it in and say negative x minus 5 squared plus 25. This is now in standard form. Okay. Where a, a is on the outside here is negative 1. B, or sorry, B. Uh, H is 5, and K is 25. I'm not going to check my work here, feeling pretty confident, uh, but definitely if you're not sure if you're uh, completing the square, then you can expand this thing and make sure you get back to where you started. So for part B, the vertex here, is at hk, which in this case is at 525. And if you're feeling uh, anxious, you can check it using Desmos, right? You can map it right away. The x-intercept are where y equals 0. Here, let's just see if we're expecting any x-intercepts. I've got a is less than 1, so it's going to be pointing down. My vertex is above the x-axis, so at some points, two points, it'll cross the x-axis. So that means I can go ahead and I can find these uh, x-intercepts. I'm going to use this to solve when y is 0, solve for x when y is 0. Oops. So y is negative x minus 5 squared plus 25. Set y equal to 0, negative x minus 5 squared plus 25. Add 25, or sorry, subtract 25 from both sides. Negative 25 is negative x minus 5 squared. Divide the negative, divide or multiply, it doesn't matter. Uh, negative over to this side goes away, 25 must be x minus 5 squared. Take the square root of both sides. Here's a key, right? When we take the square root, we have to get plus minus the square root of 25 is x minus 5, which means we get uh, the square root of 25 is 5, right? Plus minus 5. Plus minus 5 is x minus 5. So x, if we're solving for it, is uh, plus 5 minus 5, and x is negative 5 minus 5. Oh, e plus 5. Right. When I move this over here uh, and solve for x, I'm adding 5. E. Nothing happened here. So x is 10, and x is 0. 
So it looks like it's going to cross the x-axis at x equals 0. But remember, this is also where y equals 0. So this is going to make sense once we find the y-intercept. I'm still going to go through and do it um, because it's not obvious right away when we're just starting with these. So the x-intercepts are at 10, 0, and 0, 0 probably in a different order, right? 0, 0, and 10, 0. But the y-intercept is where x is 0. So y is <clears throat> negative x minus 5 squared plus 25. When x is 0, y is negative 0 minus 5 squared plus 25 confirms what we just found, right? Negative 5 squared is 25. Negative 25 plus 25 is at 0. So the y-intercept is at y equals 0. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say 0, 0. And then up here, this was at 10, 0, and 0, 0. Kind of a special case. All right, I'm just going to do a quick sketch here. I know it goes through 0, 0. I know it's going to cross through 10, 0. All right, those are my x and y intercepts. 0, 0 happens to be both. And somewhere up here at 525 is our vertex. So then I can sketch this in, something like that. And then finally, part D the domain here, of course, is all real numbers from negative infinity to infinity. And the range, well, the range is going to go from negative infinity all the way up to y equals 25. So including 25 square bracket. Let's confirm it in Desmos. Dink, dink. I'll start with the original equation. Negative x squared plus 10x. Okay. Hey, it looks, looks like what we found, so that's a good start, right? Uh, and then if I also graph negative x minus 5 squared plus 25, okay, it looks like these two things are overlapping. What a relief. We did it right. <laughs> Okay, so I'll leave, I was going to do a last one, but uh, we don't really have time to do another one. So uh, try doing 23 on your own, and then um, we'll start using it for review next day. How about? Or maybe I should grab it first. Do 23 on your own. We will start there as review next day. All right, and 23 was this one. All right. Any questions? Uh, just 
out of no context of the today's work. When is the next next test? Uh, I was trying to figure it out. I want to have it after chapter three. So I'll figure out um, for next week. So I'll tell you guys on Tuesday next week when to expect the test. But uh, probably kind of not next week, obviously, but probably the following week or the week after that on the Tuesday. We'll see. I'll All right. Give you guys Thank you. A heads up. <laughs> no problem.